Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this Sunday morning, the 21st of March. I've brought out uh, the um, girl pigs. We drove them round here from where they are with uh, uh, um, Clemmy and the little piglets which you met when they were just an hour old yesterday and these girls who live in the same enclosure are fascinated by the piglets and very gentle with them and so um, we brought them out for a little bit of freedom this morning on a grey morning and rather chilly morning but it's Passion Sunday and so we change gear today completely and go from our Lenten journey onto the way of the cross and so if you've got one of the um, daily prayer, and I know that some of you have from, from your messages sent in, then we begin today on page 250, which is morning prayer for Passion Tide, and we shall use parts of that, certainly the, the introduction. And uh, these will be having a nice time. Leo's a little bit nervous of them, and I'm trying to convince him that pigs actually can't get onto the table, but uh, I don't think he quite believes it at the moment. So here we are with the prayers for Passion Tide. Bring your concerns from across the world and uh, you, unite them with our prayers to enrich our worship as we enter Passion Tide together. O Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving power among the nations. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation. To you be praise and glory forever. As a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, your only Son was lifted up, that he might draw the whole world to himself. May we walk this day in the way of the cross and always be ready to share its weight, declaring your love for all the world. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and for ever. Amen. Our psalm on this 21st morning of the month is Psalm 105, and we use some of the verses of that long psalm now. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises, and tell of his marvellous works. Rejoice in the praise of his holy name. Let the hearts of them rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember the marvels he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. He brought his people out of Egypt with silver and gold. There was not one of the tribes that stumbled. Egypt was glad at their departing, for a dread of them had fallen upon them. He spread out a cloud for a covering and a fire to light up the night. They asked, and he brought them quails. He satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock, and the waters gushed out, and ran in the dry places like a river. For he remembered his holy word and Abraham his servant. So he brought forth his people with joy, his chosen ones with singing, he gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the fruit of their toil, that they might keep his statutes and faithfully observe his laws. It's a hymn of pilgrimage. It's also a hymn of God's nourishment of his people, but it gives us wonderful images of the bread of heaven and image of the Spirit gushing forth like water from the rock, to refresh not only the people, but also the wilderness. Let me just give a little bit of 
bread from earth to these. I've got some stale bread from the kitchen here, which they'll enjoy to eat. So let me put that down before we start to read our bits and pieces from the scriptures and think on that. Now normally we've been reading from the Gospel of St John and indeed at the Eucharist uh, I shall be preaching on John 12 because that's the Gospel for today but this special lesson is always for Sundays and our special lesson for morning prayer is taken from the letter to the Hebrews. It's a, a wonderful letter and some people still think that it was written by Paul most think not, and I have friends who believe that it was written, for example, by Barnabas, because Barnabas was a Levite and knew all the details of temple worship and the ins and outs of that kind of liturgical law, and those images the writer to the Hebrews uses in a great deal, and particularly the image of Melchizedek, the um, priest forever, which the psalmist mentions, and this, this strange character as the writer says in the Hebrews, without generation, just sort of standing alone. Uh, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Well, all of that is there. Others that I know think it's by Apollos, or there are other um, theories about it. It doesn't matter. It's very clearly a, a letter of the early church. And we're reading this morning from chapter 12 and beginning at verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, and darkness, and gloom, and a tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given, if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight of Moses that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Another image, an image of the Spirit just as the waters gushing from the rock and now the consuming fire. But the most important part of all of this and it will be so with the Gospel at the Eucharist in John 12 is the fact that the humanity of Jesus proclaims physically that divine gift and intention. And that is what we embrace on Passion Sunday morning as we go from our Lenten journey to follow him on the way of the cross. That will become more and more evident as we read through the chapters of St John at our morning prayers in the week to follow, this Passion Week leading up to Palm Sunday and next Sunday the entry of our Lord into Jerusalem. But remember this morning what we have been learning all the way through Lent in our journeying. The fact that all the promises and words and images which Jesus gives us 
are words from his own ministry spoken and given at a particular time and in a particular place. And we take them for our worship and grow used to them and sometimes forget that we are talking about human situations which are giving us aspects of the divine. Human things which are finite and as the writer to the Hebrews says can be shaken and will disappear representing things of heaven which can never be shaken, can never change. A gift that Jesus bids us receive and those who are the body of Christ have not only been receiving but encouraging others to receive ever since. It's a wonderful gift and placing it in context makes it even better. Yesterday from the pigsty with the little piglets around me, the nine newborn, just an hour old piglets of Clemmy, I mentioned the story of the prodigal son and we use the prodigal son's words from the pigsty in the Gospel of St Luke in our prayer book worship and this is a day, the 21st of March, when we remember Archbishop Thomas Cranmer because it was the day he was burned at the stake for heresy and at this point in the beginning of morning prayer in order to make us ready to say morning prayer in the Book of Common Prayer, the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, Cranmer places one of the sentences and one of them is spoken in the pigsty by the prodigal son. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against God and against you and am no more worthy to be called your son. Well, let's remember where that was spoken. In the very depths of despair, that despair was used as a gift to the prodigal to make him realise the love of his father. And he intends to go home in penitence. But as he approaches, with all those words prepared to say to his father, treat me as one of your hired servants, not as your son, the father runs down the road to greet him. And here's the image given in Hebrews of us not approaching something frightening and terrifying. The frightening and terrifying aspect for the prodigal son was the depth of despair in the pigsty when he was sharing the pig's morning breakfast because no one would give him anything to eat. That was the terrifying part. When he got home, of course he was terrified. He was approaching in penitence. But what he received was the joy which were given at the end of that chapter of the Hebrews of the glory awaiting us, of the arms of God himself around us, welcoming home. And those words that we say, we heard some more of those words when we read of the beginning of the raising of Lazarus story in John chapter 11. And in the same way, Martha, greeting Jesus in that little country road which led up to Bethany, going out as a dear friend. Remember, Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And she goes to meet him. And in response to her, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then Jesus says, uh, after Martha says, I know he will rise at the resurrection on the last day, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? That one believing that will never die? And she says, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who was to come into the world, emblem not only of our humanity, Son of Man, but totality of the gift and essence that God desires to recreate of those who were made in the divine image. Spoken, let's put it into context, just outside an ordinary village, on an ordinary lane, between two 
very not ordinary friends, but two human beings sharing our capacity to embrace the divine. One could go through so many sentences, which we know by heart from the scriptures, but what we've been doing in the garden, not only in Lent, but for the whole of the past year, is seeing that those words are spoken in a particular context, that the gift of Jesus is given and his humanity is given for such a short time, but in a particular context, among a particular people, which then is lifted into the present tense with the I am statement, always in the present tense, spoken in the present tense to Martha and spoken in the present tense to the Twelve. I am the true vine and those wonderful sentences and pictures become present tense for us. May they do so throughout Passion Tide as we follow Jesus in his vocation in reality in our humanity to receive not only the bread of heaven but also the waters of the Spirit, refreshing ourselves and any wilderness in which we find ourselves or in which humanity finds itself, for we are the bearer of that gift and at the same time the consuming fire, not in a frightening way, but a fire which lights up our humanity with the Spirit, the last sentence of that passage from the wonderful letter to the Hebrews, given again as a gift to the Church. Well, let's, let's just see for a moment other things which have happened on this day, because some of them are quite wonderful. As I say, this is a day that we remember Thomas Cranmer, the 21st of March, who was burned at the stake on this day as a heretic. But that happened in 1556. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury then. And during his years before that as Archbishop of Canterbury, we remember him best for the liturgy and words he was so able at crafting from his own spirituality and literary gifts. I remember this day only too well in 2013 because it's the day on which I enthroned and installed Justin Welby as Archbishop of Canterbury. That's eight years ago. And so we pray for him and Caroline on this anniversary day and give thanks for his ministry and pray all the gifts of the Spirit necessary to engage in and fulfil that monumental task as Primate of All England and leader of the Anglican Communion at this time. In the older calendar, 21st of March was the feast day of St Benedict and that too is precious to us here because of the threads of the Benedictine life which still is a deep, deep instinct in this community. An instinct of working in body, mind and spirit within a community given to hospitality. And all of that comes on this day. But in 1946 on this day, an Iron Bevan announced the government proposals for a free national health service for the United Kingdom. Well, that too we've had cause during these months to give enormous thanks for and for the selfless giving of so many involved in the National Health Service as so many of you will be giving thanks for those who look after your health during this pandemic and those who are fighting off the pandemic by so many different means. On this day in 2020, we saw following the closure of all schools uh, on the 19th, we saw the closure of all cafes, pubs, restaurants, theatres, gyms, leisure centres, all the places where people come together. And really that has never regained strength to open during all these on and off times of lockdown and not. And so we still await the time when we can freely come together and even more so, but more distant, when there will be no such thing as social distancing or the wearing of masks and things of that kind. But for the moment, of course, they're hugely important. And then I wanted to mention that on this day in 2017, Colin Dexter died. Now, he wrote wonderful detective stories about Inspector Morse, 
who became a, a real figure on television for years. And since then, there have been spin-offs, which Colin Dexter was involved in, of Lewis, and one that we always enjoy hugely, Endeavour. And Colin Dexter had been a, a student of classics, a teacher of classics, and then after that suddenly discovered he had a gift for writing. And he gave to Inspector Moore some of his interests, the doing of very hard cryptic crosswords, for example, the love of opera, and the love of real English beer. Not fizzy, not chilled, but real English beer. And that very much became part of the character of Inspector Morse. And we give thanks for these creative skills of folk who set us puzzles in their novels, and detective stories always do that, so that our mind is exercised. But in physicality, so to speak, and in humanity, Colin Dexter, through every television episode while he could, would appear, as Hitchcock used to, just in a cameo role, saying nothing, but you recognise him in a crowd scene or something and think, ah, there's Colin Dexter, the writer, and it placed it into a human context. And all of those things we remember on this day, together with a, a, a humorous um, uh, anniversary as well, in uh, 1997, the Reverend Wilbert Vere Audrey died. We best know him as W. Audrey, who was a, a parish priest, as his father had been, but he also wrote and had illustrated all the Thomas the Tank Engine stories, which have delighted children and adults and those who love steam trains ever since. Thanks be to God for all these creative gifts. This is a very special day for us because uh, Danny, uh, Fletcher's sister, it has a birthday today. So uh, she is in Spain with her mother and uh, daughter Arabella and we shout out a big happy birthday to Danny on this day, the 21st of March. So many anniversaries and we can give thanks for all of those. But together today, most of all, we begin the way of the cross and enter Passion Tide. Let's therefore look first of all at those for whom we're praying and uh, this 21st of March sees us praying in the Anglican Communion for the Church of England. So we receive the benefit of the prayers of the whole Anglican Communion for the Church of England. And that's a nice uh, coincidence on this anniversary of Justin's installation into the throne of St Augustine. And then in the Diocese of Canterbury today, and you'll have your own intentions from your own communities of faith worldwide, um, we pray for the parishes of St. Peter and St. Paul Saltwood and St. Stephen at Lynn and pray for Barry Knott in his ministry there and for the hospital chaplain there, Tricia Hill, and pray for the whole life of that, those parishes as we say our prayers this morning. A different collect, of course, on this particular day because we have entered Passion Tide. So bring your own intentions and prayers and concerns as we say together the collect for the fifth Sunday of Lent, Passion Sunday. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So together, in different languages, whichever you like to use, we say the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Moment of silence now for your own prayers on this Passion Sunday morning. Christ crucified draw you to himself to find in him a sure ground for faith 
a firm support for hope and the assurance of sins forgiven and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love and those whom you would pray for today and always. Amen. So let's go and just give maybe something of the bread of heaven to these here. They're going to go up to the far end of the orchard to give uh, um, Clemmy a chance to spend some time with her piglets away from the girls. Come on, we'll go on and find the others. Come on, he's not quite bread of heaven, but it's enough. We'll go and find these who've gone to have a drink. Come on, girls. Hi. Come on. Here we are. Hello. Come on. Come on. Hi, look, here we are. <laughs>